welcome all once again, and thank you for joining us today in our second webinar in the autism series. I'm Sai Ranjani Arun. I'm the CEO of Tillit, the childcare platform. Newspert is one of the offerings by Tillit that hosts a series of webinars and content on early years development, parenting, and childcare. Our previous webinar on autism spectrum conditions focused on the early signs to watch for, steps to consider if a child is suspected to be on the spectrum, and how parents with children on the spectrum can manage their own mental well-being. In today's webinar, we're going to speak with two lovely experts about the easy to implement strategy for supporting children on the spectrum and managing their behavior. So I see two objectives of today's webinar. One is to gain a better understanding of autistic behaviors. The second, learn simple strategies to understand and support children who may be on the spectrum. In the world, approximately 1% of the population is diagnosed with autism. And this number is growing. However, people on the spectrum are still a big minority. There are lots of people who don't accept and treat them as equals or just people with brain differences. Today, on the third day of the World Autism Acceptance Week, we are delighted to have Tejal and Dr. Divya with us to spread more awareness on autism. Tejal, please can you introduce yourself to our audience? Tejal? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, a very good afternoon to everyone and a very good morning. Um, so I am Tejal Shah. Thank you so much, first of all, Sai, for having me um, to spread more awareness on autism and um, understanding, of, you know, sharing my experience about autism with uh, such a beautiful crowd. Um, I'm really thankful to Rishu also for considering me for um, this opportunity. Well, to introduce myself, I am Tejal Shah. I'm a, first of all, a very proud mother of an eight-year-old uh, with Down syndrome. Uh, she, uh, I, I've been a speaker at the United Nations last year, and I am a certified special educator. I have founded and co-founded various successful initiatives uh, such as Happiness is Cushy, which you can gauge that's from my daughter's name. Happiness is Cushy is basically uh, an educational initiative uh, wherein we develop effective structured programs and courses with top of the ladder trainers who are absolutely passionate and dedicated to the cause on different areas um, for children, teenagers, adults, parents, educators, um, we have it for everybody. To support and raise aspirations is the goal for people with autism, Down syndrome, learning, learning disabilities, and also other developmental delays. So some of our initiatives have been a science program, which has been uh, also considered in the Guinea's book, Guinea's World Records, but of course, due to, due to the number, we are still waiting to be published uh, in that because it has been the first science program which we have launched. We have done Ghana. So this is for across special needs, which we do. Um, and also I, I was nominated by uh, the Karnataka State Co Commissioner for, for the national award in the category of best individual uh, working for the cause of intellectual disability. So that's about me. Thank you so okay. much for having me once again. Thank you so much, Tejal. Dr. Divya, would you like to go next, please? Thank you, Sai. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Divya Madan. I'm currently working as a pediatric resident in Jekyllon Hospital, Jaipur, India. Uh, working as a resident and uh, having constant interaction with children and their parents. I am uh, glad that uh, you have given me the opportunity to share my experiences uh, with such uh, special children and the parents. That's it. Thank you so much, Divya. Great, thank you again, both of, both of you for joining us today. I'll uh, dive straight into our agenda. Our um, first segment focuses on understanding behavior. Um, so Tejal, I'll start with you on this one. 
What are some of the common behaviors or actions that can be seen in children who are on the spectrum? Thank you for the question. So before we actually dive into, uh, you know, knowing the challenges, the behavioral challenges so, um, in this, these children, let us know what exactly behavior is for our children. So basically what I feel, and according to the experience, and um, I'm sure you would agree, behavior is not uh, something which is our reaction to any situation or what, you know, we interpret. Uh, like for example, you know, if a child is not list listening or showing no interest uh, or he's just throwing himself, right? So we name it a tantrum, right? It's, so it's not his behavior. Um, it, it's not that he is behaving. So it's, it's our interpretation. That's not behavior. So what I would say behavior is an action which is being seen or heard and is always measurable and observable, such as um, crying. You know, it's absolutely very common in our children with the, uh, autism, throwing, spitting, pinching, screaming. You know, these are all actual behaviors. And one of the most challenging behaviors, if you, if you call out in general, it, it is basically the social challenges. Um, people with autism, uh, uh, most of them have social issues, um, interacting with others. There are communication gaps you know, and uh, when we talk about problem behavior, so, so um, how does problem behavior be uh, being identified? So it basically results from not understanding what he or she is asked to do. For example, you know, echolalia also is a kind of problem behavior because the child doesn't understand and he tends to equally as well. It is just a repetition of what the parent is saying or anybody is uh, talking to him. It's a lack of uh, communication skills there, right? So right. Uh, la lack of vocabulary, I would say. So there is um, difficulty in communication, wants and needs. So uh, that is also part of problem behavior. So these are the behavioral challenges uh, which a lot of our children face on a regular basis. So the, and of course the most important, uh, which I have to mention is the sensory issues. Hypersensitivity and hyposensitivity are the major, major behavioral challenges which our children face with autism. So when I say hypersensitive, <clears throat> sorry, hypersensitivity is something which is, you know, uh, the child can be, can be too, uh, with sound, with uh, any kind of texture, noise, or any food. So it can be hyper. So even if the, the, the very touch can be very inflammatory or the very sound can be very, uh, you know, uh, very amplified for the child. So that is hypersensitivity. And what is hypo when the child is seeking? Okay, so when the child is continuously biting and the, when the child is doing a repetitive behavior such as um, uh, you know, rubbing hands or just biting the nails and, you know, biting the dress so, or just, uh, you know, touching the, touching somebody else's body all the time. So these all are sensory issues, which are the most common challenges in our children with autism. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Tejal. Yeah. I mean, of course, stimming is one of the common things that we usually see with uh, children on the spectrum. And yeah, I think it's very important to understand that it's normal, healthy, and, and it's necessary, you know, for them to keep themselves calm, especially when they're having so many signals and they're receiving so many signals yeah. from the world. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. That was really useful. Yeah. Uh, coming to you, Divya, I understand that it's common for children on the spectrum to behave aggressively, um, either to themselves or, you know, with other people. What can lead to a child on the spectrum to just to display that aggressive uh, behavior? Uh, thanks, Ai, for the question. Uh, the question uh, here is about the aggressive behavior. So as the child uh, is uh, learning to walk and explore the surroundings, that is usually around 15 months to 18 months of age, uh, normal children also, it's not just about the children with autism uh, spectrum. Normal children also feel like they want to explore the things. They don't want any restrictions on them. 
so they keep on exploring their surroundings they want to experience new and new things and they tend to develop aggressive behavior or show some sort of temper tantrums when some restriction is on them but these things are more aggravated when it comes to children with autism spectrum and these also stay for a longer period of time because of the deficit in the social communication as tejal mentioned because they are not able to express their needs at the same time they are not able to perceive what we are instructing them and it takes longer for them to process all this information they tend to throw more temper tantrums as well as they show more aggressive behavior and this stays for longer time as compared to normal individuals so the cause of aggressive behavior is this deficit in the social communication only that's why these children they are more aggressive and they show temper tantrums more often than normal children thank you thank you tevya that was really helpful uh tejal uh, coming to you so as a special educator uh, you've spent a lot of time advising parents on managing challenging behavior could you suggest some simple strategies for parents and carers to manage their child's challenging behavior sure so you know so, uh, when you talk about the challenging behaviors which i already mentioned sometimes um just a change of environment if the child is screaming and you know he he's having a lot of uh, sensory issues and you know of noise as i mentioned and he's in a very you know, noisy uh, atmosphere what the parent can immediately do is to calm him down take him a little aside to a little um uh, area where there is no noise immediately change the environment that can just control the situation and reduce the stimulation that is one and uh, as far as uh, a daily routine i would suggest visual scheduler is a must for every child with autism because they just thrive with a schedule they if you give them rules they will be just perfect in that so i also would like to show you how the visual scheduler work i have it uh, with me i generally use okay. it so uh, so you know for example you can just start off with the daily activities to start off with uh, when you when if parents ask me what is exa- what exactly how do we start off when you talk about visual schedule how do we make it so uh, i've just taken a plain board uh, just an a4 laminated sheet and uh, if i have to just uh, start from the morning okay so what i do is i show the child okay uh, you know did you see the sun has uh, risen up in the sky it's morning time so let's see okay and it's just we we stick the card here can you see it yes yeah yeah so we stick the morning card and the sun is going up and we talk a lot in that and then this child knows that every morning the sun is up okay what's the next thing we do oh okay so we go to the washroom okay so we we we, we go to the washroom and then we we put the card okay and then we once we finish the washroom time we remove the card and put it in the finish basket so the activity is over so this kind of thing and then okay after that i can't find the uh, yeah so and then okay after washroom time what is it the next is brushing time okay so we can actually stick it there is some something which is called blue tag and you can just stick it through that i just don't have it right now otherwise i would have stuck it and shown you and you can place it like a structure so the child knows after this 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 and every day if you do it it becomes so convenient for the child to actually follow and then you don't have to struggle after uh, after a while so if this is done because they all are very very visual learners so something like this it really works miracles so you know you can do this and and i i already mentioned about the uh, sensory issues right so there are sensory issues in terms of uh, textures um, noise so you can what you can do is make different sensory kits like what i have done in my educational toolkit is i have made this is sensory texture toolkit if you can see so there are like different textures we can just you know uh, make the uh, child feel throughout the hand you know on the legs so that the uh, you know the sensory uh, needs come down after a period of time so different textures shiny texture you can talk about the texture sand paper you know different feels so initially if we, you know you come to know also you can assess by that time that what is actually uh, where is the child getting aggravated which is mm. uh, which he does not like so the assessment also happens so then you try to introduce that kind of texture more so we have all this do jute texture 
you know so all different textures um cards you can make something buttons textures the feels all different feels you can just make it like ice cream sticks so i've done it like this so you can all make your all sensory toolkits depending on textures you can make it for sounds so it really works very well so i use it a lot so i think these can be worked and also for behavior management what you can do is as i already mentioned and i keep mentioning that visual is the key to success showing anything visual really works so for example if the child has a behavior of biting okay so you show this then uh, uh, you know and and he doesn't know that you know he is just seeking so that is how he's biting but that is not a good behavior he will not be accepted in the society so maybe some cards like this and then you make then i keep different emotions and then you can talk to child about okay if you're going to bite like this do you think mama is going to be happy or she's going to be sad is your teacher going to be happy so he points if he points to a wrong a wrong expression that you had it so you have the task to do so you need to uh, give an understanding that no you need it's it's everybody is going to be angry and you cannot be happy that time because then nobody is going to play with you so that is how you need to counsel the child a lot so i have like made like 20 cards of reinforcement like what all our children go through behave it's called a behavior tool and uh, yeah like shouting so this can uh, be really helpful if it is and of course you can't just use it once and done it consistency is the key so these are the yeah. methods which you can use great some brilliant examples coming out of that uh, visual scheduler is something that i've taken away and obviously visual learning is uh, the most effective way to reach yes. to these children brilliant um thanks tejas so i'm going to stick with you for a little longer okay. uh, many children on the spectrum have meltdowns yes uh, especially when they are in public people often find it hard to tell autism meltdowns and temper tantrums apart yes but they are very different things right Absolutely. so if a child has meltdowns how how do we anticipate them uh, how do we identify their causes how can we minimize their frequency yes so uh, you know basically an autistic meltdown is what i say is being very overwhelmed or over or too much of an overload of everything so and and tantrums is something wherein you just you need a lot of people you need a lot of audience you know and then that, that tantrum uh, uh, will uh, tantrum behavior will usually stop uh, when you know the parents ignore the behavior and when the child is removed from a public place and uh, the behavior is occurring or you give the child his favorite toy if he is at home and is just simply crying for something and is just nagging so that is immediately manageable by some reinforcement which doesn't happen when it comes to meltdown right. so uh, what happens there are uh, so in uh, what happens in terms of meltdown it is much more beyond a tantrum it is not at all a tantrum because the person the uh, the person who uh, who is diagnosed with autism they themselves know they themselves do not know what is happening that extreme they have no control over their emotions that time so uh, and that can be easily identified if at all uh, because the, because you will see the reinforcements are not working mm -hmm. and if your whatever favorite th activity um, your uh, whatever his interest activity you're doing or uh, that is not going to work so at that time you have to be the calmest person you have to just let the child be and try if it's a really brightly lit place try to dim the lights a little bit if it is a noisy place try to minimize the sound around if there are a lot of people just let everybody uh, you know kindly ask everybody to leave that place and just be next to your child and just help them help the child to come just see whether he wants a hug or he wants you to stay away you need to be very observant about that and mm. once he once he actually goes down once he actually uh, you know settles down it will take a while after that sit and uh, you know talk to the child but you have to talk to the child as to what happened you know it's okay so all these things will come only but but the, the main thing is to reduce uh, the uh because after the meltdown it's really challenging for the parent to actually handle so what we can do is we should as parents so what i suggest is 
to reduce these signs of overload, uh, now you should see the behaviors happening over a period of time. So if, for example, now if you see the uh, child closing eyes for a very longer time, or he's putting hands uh, continuously, right? So mm -hmm. these are all triggers. So it, you should see it is uh, how the frequency is increasing means that time you need to intervene. And uh, also, uh, uh, you know, uh, the stimming behavior, uh, like, like the child would be rocking himself, but suddenly mm -hmm. the pace is really increasing. So that's the time you know, okay, it's going to go, it's going really high. Or sometimes it happens that the self-talk, you know, self-talk goes, I mean, generally it is there, but when there is going to, uh, the meltdown go, uh, is happening, it, it actually increases to a very large extent. So you need to be observant of all these um, uh, behavior changes. So continuously you should be, um, uh, you know, identifying and be observant about these particular behaviors when it comes to meltdown. Brilliant. So what I take away from here is be observant, be calm, be there for the child, try to manage the triggers as much as possible, especially yeah. if the child is around a bright or a uh, noisy environment. Yes. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, Divya, I'll come to you next. Um, obviously, Tejal did bring up a few points there, but could you suggest uh, a few basic coping skills that parents can teach children whenever they're feeling frustrated or anxious or uh, stressed? So as the usual mentioned that keeping calm and being patient is the key. So uh, parents, first of all, should know that they are doing a good job. And if some their child just learns things differently, he's gaining and perceiving the environment differently. And uh, you have to just adapt to that situation and uh, try to observe your child more, try to learn uh, things about him more, try to uh, be uh, in his or her shoes with how he or she is perceiving the environment and work accordingly. Uh, temper tantrums could be easily managed by uh, reinforcing or providing the triggering thing. So to firstly, to differentiate between meltdown and a temper tantrum, you should know the antecedent factor that led to that situation. So if parents think that the child is crying because he or she needs some toy or something, that's why he or she is behaving in a certain way. So it's definitely a temper tantrum where child is in full control. He knows he's doing this. He's crying. He's rocking or he's beating himself or biting himself to get that thing, to grab that attention. And it's definitely a temper tantrum. And when it's some sensory overload and the child is just having a meltdown, then obviously these things won't work after everything settles down tell the child try to uh, get into his world that why he behaved that way or why this is happening with him and just be calm trust your instincts trust your guts that yes this thing we are going to work out together be with him that's it Staying calm, patience is all uh, I could recommend. Having a peer group, having a community also helps. Exp uh, sharing your experiences, learning from experiences of other parents with such, uh, similar children would also help. Brilliant, thank you. So trust your instincts and have a strong uh, peer group or a community, brilliant. Super, so that brings us to the end of the first segment. Our uh, second segment focuses on diagnosis and assessments. Uh, Divya, I'll start with you here. As a doctor, please can you advise what type of specialists or doctors are best placed to, di to diagnose autism in children? Uh, for screening of uh, children with autistic uh, spectrum disorder, a pediatrician can, uh, a certified pediatrician, a qualified pediatrician uh, can definitely screen them and refer to further pediatric neurologist. When it comes to diagnosis, diagnosis can be made by a pediatric neurologist, a certified special educator, a board certified therapist. Uh, so it is a multidisciplinary approach to making a diagnosis. So any of these could make the diagnosis and you should know that this is not uh, 
this is not something that ca can be made in a one sitting. We can always have multiple sittings and this diagnosis evolves over a period of time and depends on the intervention we are doing. So no one can throw this diagnosis at once at you. Make sure that you are having multiple sittings or the doctor or the board certified therapist is spending enough time with your child and knowing your experiences before coming to such diagnosis. Brilliant. Makes sense. Uh, I'll stick with you again, uh, Divya. Just one other question. What is the difference between a functional skill assessment and an occupational and sensory assessment? Are both of these required in all instances? So uh, when we talk about functional skill assessment, we are actually assessing the functional skills of the child. Functions, functional skills are those skills that are required for the child to function independently in the society, right? These include basic things such as domestic care, your personal hygiene, uh, your uh, vocational verbal skills, uh, how you react to a certain situation in public environment. Uh, all these things come under the umbrella term of the functional skill assessment. So uh, the idea of the special education is to make the child functional in the society. So, uh, right. So in this functional skill assessment, we assess the child uh, at which level the child stands in the society. Is, is he or she able to cope up independently when he's out of the school into the world? How is functioning? Uh, and when it comes to a sensory or occupational assessment, uh, all the sensory concerns that Tejal mentioned, uh, it focuses on that. So right. the, uh, all the sensory overload that the child faces in the day-to-day -day life, how to cope up with these and what are these concerns and how we can help them with providing those sensations by those sensory kits and how can we regulate that uh, sensory information, that load of that sensory information in day-to-day -day life, that is uh, by occupational and sensory assessment. So uh, yes, both are important. Initially, uh, we do these sensory assessments. We, we regulate all these sensory information. And when it comes to functional skill assessment, this is done when the child is in school. Right. We're preparing the child for the transition. Right from the school, he has to go to the college or has to work outside. So we're preparing the child for the transition. So that's when functional skill assessment comes into role. Okay, understood. So yeah, so based on what you uh, what you've just said, it looks like both both types of assessments are necessary. Uh, you first start with the sensory assessment, which will then be followed by functional assessment. Brilliant. Uh, Tejal, as a special educator, you've worked with a lot of children on the spectrum. Uh, and of course, you've had multiple conversations with their parents as well. Um, so what's your take on um, how much do these assessments cost? Like, are they expensive? Or do you have like other alternatives which are more affordable? Yes. So um, I'm in the most expensive city in India. So, so here, the cost is somewhere between six to 10,000. So I understand that the other cities uh, might be slightly lesser. That is the range. Um, but otherwise, if uh, you know, if it sounds expensive to parents, uh, what we generally suggest um, to there is a uh, there is a checklist which uh, which you can actually use it, uh, which is in the PDF form available online to. Assess on your own. The parent can actually assess on their own. There are like 23 items, which is called M Chat, which is um, uh, uh, which is called M Chat. The full form is Modified Checklist for Autism in Toddlers. Okay, so uh, it is called M Chat and consists of 23 items, um, and uh, uh, which is developed to be directed to the child's parent or the child's primary caregiver. Okay, right. each, uh, so in each item uh, in the scale, uh, you can answer, there, there is an answer, a yes or a no. So, and um, the first nine of these are, uh, were taken from the chat. Uh, that is the remaining items were prepared by those who uh, developed these scales. 
uh, and the second section based on the observation. I'm sorry. <coughs> sorry, just one second. No problem. Yeah, I'm so sorry about it. Okay. Yeah, so basically this MCHAT is a screening test. You know, it's the most recent screening test in the um, literature, I would say, amongst uh, the first level. So uh, once uh, the parents uh, are able to identify this in this, there is a certain scale, okay? Uh, so if there are like, uh, is, is the rating. So if you reach a certain number, uh, well, I, I'm not sure about the exact number. It will show. It will show uh, when you actually, um, you know, are filling the form. Uh, if the number is higher to certain uh, certain digit, then uh, you are at a higher risk to autism. If the number is lower, you are at lower risk. So accordingly, the parents can go for a formal assessment, which uh, uh, already uh, Divya has mentioned. And I would like to add that uh, clinical psychologist uh, is. Uh, the main uh, person who can do actually the uh, assessment, the formal assessment, if you want. And um, uh, the informal assessment is also, we like uh, as special educators also do it. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you want the formal assessment, which the schools uh, usually want, so you should be going to, a, 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 you know, um, clinical psychologist who will give you a formal, but uh, for our uh, uh, therapies to be organized or the sessions which we take, we generally do the assessment, the informal one to understand where the child is. And accordingly, we develop the IEP, which is called the individualized educational plan for every child. And we start working on the goals accordingly. So that is how it works. Brilliant. So there are uh, a lot of self-assessment resources and tools available out there, MCHAT being one of them. Re yes. Really useful. Thank you, Tejal. Um, coming back to you, Divya, um, figuring out what to do after an autism diagnosis can be really overwhelming. And after, after that, parents are co like continuously hungry for information. So what important questions should parents ask the doctors and therapists who are treating their children? Uh, first of all, uh, in the first meeting, as I mentioned earlier also, that we do not come up with a diagnosis in first meeting. You just tell the parents that yes, your child seems to be on the spectrum. He has certain risk. Um, maybe he, he or she will uh, be in the gray zone. Maybe the child has lower risk. Maybe the child just has speech issues. Maybe the child is there on the higher side. But uh, First and foremost, we make them comfortable with the idea that yes, no two individuals are the same and your child is also different. How he or she is perceiving the environment is different. So this overwhelming response that we see in the parents uh, is not something uncommon. Uh, we see it regularly in our clinics. Sometimes they turn out to be aggressive listening to the diagnosis because of the stigma attached to it. Sometimes they themselves go into the meltdown that, uh, no, this cannot happen to my child. He's just normal. He's just <laughs> learning things slowly. He'll get all right. Uh, you have to make them understand that the gravity of the situation is uh, made exaggerated because of the stigma here in India. So they need to be more aware Attaching them to the peer group or a community helps most of the time, making them acquainted with parents of uh, children with autism helps a lot. There are a lot of questions in, uh, that they themselves come up with. Why my child is behaving in a certain way? Why uh, this, ha this happened because of this? Especially in the rural backgrounds, they come up with the stigma that the breast milk of the mother is bad. And that's why the child is this way. And they usually blame uh, the female gender of the family for anything that is happening to the child. So first of all, awareness is really important. Uh, we are constantly working towards that. The other questions uh, that the parents come up with are relating to how the child will function in the society well, will he be as intellect as other children? Will he be able to 
sit in a normal school and sit, uh, study with people. So these are the questions and we just assure them that we cannot tell them this, these all things right now. It takes a lot of time, a lot of follow-up, a lot of therapy sessions, after which we can make the child to function as normal as possible. Right? We have to we counsel them from time to time that this is not a grave diagnosis and uh, you have not lost your child. Right? This is something that is manageable and your child can be just another children in the room just have to keep calm so trusting your doctor trusting your special educator or therapist uh, is here very important and awareness uh, is very important which is lacking in india absolutely i think that's why i like the term neurodiversity because it takes away that negative element uh, and challenges the negative element in words you know that are associated with autism they typically use words like disorder or disability I mean, it's a condition end of the day. So I, I quite like the neurodiversity term. Uh, it's, it's quite positive, creates a lot of awareness. Brilliant. So that brings us to the third segment of today's webinar. Uh, this segment is on diet and nutrition. Um, Tejal, I'll start with you on this. Children with autism are far more likely to be overly selective in what they will and will not eat. So how can parents manage feeding challenges in children on the spectrum? Right. So, um, you know, um, as by now we know that children with autism have a lot of sensory difficulties and um, may be selective, very selective also uh, with their diet because of their compulsive behaviors. Um, and some of them may be having motor and sensory challenges uh, that you know, that actually restricts their ability to eat a variety of foods. So a child with motor deficit, um, for example, will have trouble in chewing. Also, uh, they might have trouble, trouble in swallowing their own saliva sometimes because the motor is so weak, right? So which is why, uh, you know, they may develop preference for very smooth foods that would not require uh, much of effort, right? So imagine, you know, if you have some difficulty of physical ability to put just just put the food in your mouth and just move it around. Uh, it's it's you know if you have the difficulty, the tongue is not moving, and you have food food in your mouth. How do you actually eat it? It's such a tough task, right? So the, so it's basically a motor deficit. So food is no longer fun, right? After that, and uh, all of a sudden you start gagging and you can't swallow it. So you naturally would gravitate towards food that is more easy and, uh, you know, easy to manage and to eat, right? So uh, some children may have a sensory intolerance, as I mentioned, uh, well, like, for example, I, I, I think I mentioned, um, for example, if there is a apple, Right, I, I gave an example recently. I think so. So, if you have, if they have to chew an apple, there is a amplified noise which is coming. So mm. they they will definitely not want to, uh, you know, chew the uh, uh, bite the apple at all. So what in what at that time the parent can do? They can mash the food initially to start off with, then cut it into very small pieces, and then uh, gradually once the child has been uh, comfortable with that, and then give a little bigger pieces. Slowly, slowly, you have to uh, start de desensitizing, right? And then only they can start uh, eating those kind of foods. Um, sometimes, you know, the feeding problems may not be clear. Also, that is one possibility. Uh, mm -hmm. What happens is uh, children, uh, a child is only eating fries, right? So they are just chewing. Um, so you, at that time, you can rule out the motor issues. Um, right, so then, then the resistance to other foods, maybe it's just their preference, right? So um, if you have a child who is only eating smooth food, we don't know if he's having an oral motor issue or it is just a preference. So what in such a case the professionals uh, suggest is uh, present different foods, which I was mentioning, uh, and, you know, then observe their reactions, right? So if the child who only eats smooth and seems uh, 
having an aversion for other textures, then uh, the, you know, the professionals uh, judge the child to have motor deficits. Right, so motor deficits like the jaw weakness, the jaw is dropping or drooling is happening. So that maybe uh, if the jaw is weak, you can't chew, right? So that there is a lot of, um, uh, yeah, uh, the oromotor intervention has to be done ASAP, right? On the other hand, if the child uh, child seems to open uh, to trying to a variety of foods, right? So just in so in that case, the smooth uh, smooth food is just a preference. So that means you can just identify, right? And so there are like certified speech therapists and occupational therapists who actually deal with these uh, motor issues. And uh, we have like different tools which can be used in the mouth, like the chewy tubes. There are like tools for tongue elevation. So these tools actually help the child to strengthen the motor muscles. And uh, uh, after a period of time, they're able to come to the level of uh, eating the, the regular food as well. So all that intervention has to be done. So the first step is, of course, the assessment of whether it's a motor deficit prefer or, or a sensory deficit, or it is just a preference, right? Accordingly, the plan can be done. Great. So be aware of motor deficits, observe reactions, understand preferences, try different textures. Um, yes. Finally, you'll get to what works. Brilliant. Yes. Super. Great. Um, Divya, I'll come to you next. Um, as a pediatrician, what's your advice on how parents can ensure appropriate in intake of nutrients? How, how can they manage the gut health of the child? Uh, as Tejal mentioned, that these children can be really selective and uh, they're more prone to develop nutritional deficiencies. So there are certain red flags that the parents should know that, yes, something is wrong with my, my child. Uh, he's not getting enough calorie intake or enough nutrients that is required to sustain uh, his growth, his or her growth. So if uh, these are certain red flags that I want to list out, if uh, your child is not gaining enough weight, then right. this is something you should be concerned about. If your child is really very selective and taking only those selective food items in a very less quantity, then you should definitely come to your doctor and uh, have a consultation that what whatever wrong is happening with my child. If your child is uh, developing a lot of GI disturbances, uh, when I talk about GI disturbances, these can include vomiting, retching, diarrhea, constipation, frequent bloating. These are things that... Uh, uh, should be the warning signs, red flags that you should know that, that yes, something is wrong happening with him or her and I should definitely get a consultation done. Also, if your child is having a, a oral hygiene issues, brushing involves a lot of uh, texture or hard thing in your mouth. Brushing is something that uh, children with autism uh, spectrum uh, have a sensory issue with. So sometimes they don't brush, they don't have cavities, a lot of ache, toothache, and they cannot just swallow it out and might develop sepsis out of it and wow. fall really sick and uh, need intensive care. So ensure that your child has a proper hygiene and uh, all the tips that Tejal mentioned are differentiating whether it is a motor issue or it's just a preference. We usually tell the parents that if your child is having preference of two or three food items, make sure that on the plate, along with two of his favorite food items, add the one food that you want to add to his or her diet. And uh, it said that in the first 30 minutes when the child sit, a major meal intake is in that 30 minutes. So make sure that you offer uh, those things first that you want to incorporate in your child's diet. And when uh, he or she accepts a new food items, don't forget to cheer him or her up that yes, you have done a good job. Uh, you have incorporated something new into your schedule and reinforce that. Make sure that your child's feeding schedule is there there should be a feeding schedule. Don't continuously feed your child because continuously feeding your child will decrease the appetite for the major meal of the day. 
also whenever the child is sitting somewhere to feed or to eat then that area should be distraction free mm. make the child involved with the uh, process of eating or having food these can definitely help also incorporating the child in the time of uh, preparation of the meal can also help him or her to try new foods right when making chapatis you can sorry the i think it just froze with some connection issues perhaps okay they will uh by the time divya comes back could you give us some tips on gluten free diet for children on autism yes so um gluten free and casein free is the most recommended for children with autism because as we have discussed enough that they have sensory issues so their entire body is very sensitive and uh, the as uh, divya was mentioning there are gi issues um uh, a lot of digestion issues if, so because the food seems to be um the major uh, major issue here right so the child if at all the food is slightly heavy it really is very difficult for our children to digest so uh, what we suggest is gluten free is more of products with joar um you know uh, um we, we avoid uh, foods uh, which have wheat barley or rye and of course the uh, casein uh, free diet which is all the milk products we avoid okay. instead we use all so we are a uh, paneer if it all the child is too fond of paneer um uh, you know so uh, there are a lot of replacements and of course a lot of oils if you see uh, we we always suggest uh, to use oils which are uh, filtered instead of refined because the only reason is it is less processed so the nutrition value is higher so we always suggest any oil and uh, you know have a variety of oils so uh, it really uh, so all the nutrients the different nutrients of different oils also is very beneficial so and also the cold pressed oils are also much more beneficial even uh, maybe higher they have higher nutrients than the filtered oils also so uh, these kind of uh, if there are these changes in the diet it it really helps the child to and of course ragi is one of the a uh, very very high uh, calcium based food which is highly recommended for uh, children who are on gluten free diet rolled oats i would suggest is uh, wonderful uh, uh, in uh, very rich uh, nutrient value so um yeah so these are the suggestions and of course fruits vegetables and less of junk food has to be avoided and sugar to be it has to be completely off the diet of our children because they you can if, if you know so parents tell me my child is simply laughing or simply crying for no reason sometimes so i ask them uh, and i've seen them in my school sometimes you know all of a sudden the a few days he'll be fine you know you know i'll be absolutely fine sitting at one place and you know every everything would be structured and suddenly you see a a uh, change of this kind of laughter and very very hyperactive that day so uh the sugar intake so that mother would have said oh he had had a lot of cake today or he went to a birthday party and he had so much of uh, you know a lot of biscuits there so it's all sugar it's very very high content of sugar so sugar should be completely avoided from uh, the diet of of uh, you know especially the white sugar Hmm. is yeah yeah it it really okay. aggravates all these uh, um behaviors of in our children yes brilliant thank you tejal thank you divya this was really useful i think that brings us to our q and a session how we doing on time we doing good great okay so i'll pick a few questions that just came in from the audience um divya i'll probably put this first to you somebody has asked can we pro i mean what therapy can we provide if the child eats non eatable things like wall paint or putting marbles in their mouth so uh, eating uh, the things that are not eatable uh, it's called pica p i c a pica and it could be a sign of nutritional deficiencies and also in children as tejal mentioned 
when uh, there is hypo sensitivity they will keep on having things and experiences uh, they will keep on biting having things in their mouth so it could be a sensory concern too so uh, occupational therapist or uh, your sensory assessment could tell that uh, if the child is hypo sensitivity hypo sensitive and also for pica we provide nutritional supplements like iron folic acid and multivitamins and the child dramatically improves if uh, the child is having those wall paint or marbles because of some nutritional deficiency understood another question a popular question actually is tejal i'll post this to you uh, making friends isn't always easy right uh, and it can be especially challenging for kids with autism yes. how can parents support their children to make friends yeah yeah that is a major struggle which i always um come across as uh, we had already uh, discussed in the beginning that uh, one of the major challenges which our children face is social interaction social responsiveness um so there is a deficit there so how do we of course it is very time consuming it is uh, it's a long process but we have to start as early as possible the moment we come to know the child has autism we should not be wasting time and we should kick start with these activities which uh, really are very helpful okay so the first thing is that our children with autism most of the time they lack joint attention so when you're saying something they might you know that attention is not there and the processing is not there so the first thing the parent needs to it's that they have to start play okay they have to uh, introduce the concept of playing with another child so they as an adult um have to behave like a child have to come down to their level and interact uh, have a very very basic play at home um you know it can be uh, anything it can be like um, uh, um making up building blocks together or just stacking rings so you stack one ring i stack another ring you know that like that you can just start off so it has to be turn taking comes in a uh, picture okay mm -hmm. and then maybe they can have a small game like hide and seek wherein the child learns so many concepts like one has to hide the other has to count you know so many things happening so the child uh, so once the parent has introduced all these things they should start inviting other children so i would say just one at a time to be very specific and the preferred environment of the child with autism preferably in his home because he's already aware because as i said they don't like too many changes in fact not many changes at all so i already that child is a new person altogether who is coming so it's a lot to take for him right so already a new thing is happening right so before that child comes in the the parent needs to prepare the child with the, there is one uh you know a boy coming uh, maybe a boy name or uh, you can just uh, rahul is coming okay his name is rahul he can show his picture or she can show his picture and talk about that boy and everything and you, we are going to play this game with him and all that prepare the child and then introduce the other child to uh, the you know him and slowly start that uh, conversation with him so there is so much learning the more we are um introducing typical children to our children with autism it it is so beneficial for them to actually uh you know make friends and uh on a later stage of course it's a very slow process but you get there if if all these things are done in a proper way it definitely helps so something like this you can do then there are a lot of programs these days happening in all i in especially in bangalore if i have to say there are a lot of sensory programs which i mentioned uh, as i keep mentioning that they have sensory issues so there are like sensory programs wherein you know the therapist or the program uh, manager who is organizing these events they have so many equipments which have different forms of lights different forms of sounds textures which are there so in a very fun way they introduce so what happens is our children uh you know desensitize over a period of time the sensory issues also goes down if they are taken to these programs and they also see other children there because it's like a small small group program so it's it's beautiful and the child is learning and desensitizing um, you know in a fun way right mm -hmm. so and also making friends uh and seeing other children also so these kind of programs really help and also uh, a lot of our children love music 
and they really calm down in that. So, uh, you know, programs like music-based programs, uh, music, uh, what is this? There's one program called Rhythm and Rhyme, okay? So they actually sing and do a lot of expressions and uh, so they, uh, you know, which uh, with, the, with, with the child with autism generally struggles with. So they learn to other children and they also start doing it over a period of time once they start looking at the other children. Like I always mentioned that they all are visual learners. So they mm. see other children doing all these expressions. So they also enjoy the music and it's, it's all fun based programs. And uh, you know, the mother is also there. So the mother is also observing and the child is interacting so many benefits, right? So this should be done in order to reduce the gap. Also, a lot of learning happens and gradually they uh, start making friends because they observe them, right? The more they are introduced to the typical environment, the better they learn. So that's Brilliant. all. You a lot of good insights coming out of that. Be a child when you're with a child, start small. Preparation is important, but most importantly, have fun. Don't yeah. rush things. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, another popular question, uh, children on the spectrum, so Divya, this, this is for you, children on the spectrum uh, are very selective with food choices and they have, they usually have gut problems such as, you know, constipation, diarrhea and bloated stomach. Um, so how, how do you manage this? Mm -hmm. I mentioned uh, earlier also, uh, we know that the things like diarrhea, constipation happen when the child is not having a balanced diet. Uh, when I talk about balanced diet, it includes everything possible in the diet, right? We need a good proportion of carbs, we need proteins, we need fat, we need fiber, because uh, they are really selective, either because of their sensory issue or just because of the preference. Uh, some of these are missed out. That can be a cause. A second thing is uh, allergies. These children are really prone to develop allergies. Uh, as Tejal mentioned uh, about gluten-free, casein-free diet. So the most accepted hypothesis uh, for the pathogenesis of uh, autism spectrum is that disturbance in the gut-brain axis. They say that these children are really sensitive to gluten and casein. And uh, the introduction of these substances causes inflammation of the gut lining that makes the gut leaky and leaky gut absorbs everything which is in there. So it absorbs some harmful substances also, some opioid related substances that disturb the neural axis and causes the child to behave in a certain way. So restricting such substances uh, can help improve the symptoms, right? Also introduction of probiotics, if your child is not having enough of them in the form of curd, along with fruits or whatever you're offering your child. Along with that, including fiber in the form, form of oats is a good substitute. Removing the dairy products, casein, making the child go gluten-free, eliminating wheat, rye, oats, barley from the diet. Also, if your child develops bloating or rash or allergy in response to introduction of a particular substance, then Maybe your child is allergic to that substance and better you avoid it. I think that's all. Brilliant. I think we have time to sneak in just one last question. Um, what strategies can we use with teenage students if you want to reduce negative behavior and promote socially accepted behavior? Tejal, um, I'll post this to you. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, I think social teenagers are pretty... Um, uh, and uh, you know the understanding is much better so i suggest social stories it works wonder so if there is a negative behavior what you they can actually do social stories for example if there is a neg negative behavior of saying uh, some you know uh, maybe some bad words okay so what they can actually make a story like um, um, uh, what is it? Seema was a child, you know, uh, uh, who, who was 12 years old and, you know, she was playing with a friend and she used some really bad language. You know what happened after that? That friend was in tears and she did not like it. She went and told to her mother. She did not like it. Then after that, she stopped playing with her. Would you actually like to do that to your friend? 
So, and you know, it might not come in one go. You have to repeat that story a number of times mm. and you will really see a difference. So this is a very, very effective um, tool, a way, which I really use it for all my, lot of my children. So. Brilliant. That's, that's great advice. Thank you, Tejal. Yeah. That brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, I can see there are a lot more questions. We will try and get back to you on those questions by email. Sure. Um, thank you so much, uh, Tejal and Divya, for your time and sharing such valuable insights. I'm sure you know, many parents will uh, greatly benefit from this. Thanks to our audience for attending the webinar. Um, before I close, I'd just like to make a quick announcement. We'll soon be launching an online course for parents and parents-to-be. So if you'd like to join the waitlist, please check our website for course details and leave your email ID with us. We'll see you again in our next webinar. Until then, this is bye and have a wonderful day. Thank you. It was Thank wonderful. <laughs> bye. Thanks.